We will now start the Innovative City Forum Leading Edge Technologies session, subtitled Synthesis of Matter, Information and Life. I'd like to introduce the speakers who will be attending this session. Open hardware designer, Mr. Andrew Bunny Hang. Co-founder and CEO of Symbiota, Mr. Connor Dickey. Assistant Professor, Media, Arts and Sciences, MIT Media Lab, Mr. Kevin Slavin. Moderator of this session is Director of the MIT Media Lab, Mr. Joichi Ito. So, Mr. Ito, please. Good afternoon, once again. This morning, I had the privilege to address you and I talked about what kind of people we need to educate, people who understand art, science, design, and engineering. But there really is no such person. Uh, that was uh, what we were discussing over lunch. But actually, there is. Of course, you have to find them. And of course, uh, the educational environment and the corporate environment must be conducive to these people. There are people who like art as a hobby. There are people who would have liked to do or pursue different uh, professions. And of course, we need to educate a new generation of uh, uh, these people. But uh, we already have uh, uh, the, uh, people who, ha who have such uh, capabilities, and it's important to unlock the potential of these people. So try to find that kind of people in your individual organization is what I would like to encourage you to do. In selecting the members of uh, this panel, uh, we looked at uh, the people who can cover art, the science, the design, and engineering. Uh, so these are the walking examples of uh, people who can integrate all these different fields. And another common characteristic of these people is that uh, they, they think and they talk, but also they make things and they do things. Well, in Japan, we always talk about the manufacturing nation. We like to make things, but actually we're shifting. We're moving from making things to uh, holding meetings. And that's our current focus. And so at the MIT Media Lab, most of the time uh, is spent uh, on making things. Of course, we have people from different fields, but they focus on making things. And when you listen to the following presentations, I hope that you keep this in the corner of your head. I talked about the uh, bio-revolution, I talked about synthetic biology and the manufacturing ecosystem in uh, Shenzhen, and uh, also how to create that kind of a uh, ecosystem uh, in cities. Well, those were the three topics, and I think they will be touched by or covered by each of the speakers. And so if we have more people like this, that will be great. And I think you should also think about how you might try to discover these kinds of people in your organizations. So the first speaker is uh, Bunny Huang. Uh, before uh, I met him, or well, he had been famous. And so well, th all three have connections to the Media Lab. Uh, sorry, they're all insiders, but uh, he was famous uh, because when Microsoft uh, had the, or came out with Xbox, that was like a razor. Uh, so uh, the unit is uh, uh, sold below cost, and they wanted to make money by selling software. And uh, Bunny was a student at that time, and he hacked the Xbox. He understood how it worked, and he made it possible uh, to write software, non-game software, for the Xbox. And uh, uh, that's not what uh, Microsoft wanted to see, and so he was sued. And MIT saw this, and uh, we thought it was our mission to 
uh, foster these kinds of students. So we, uh, or some of the professors, fought with uh, Microsoft uh, to uh, protect Bunny. So Bunny has been that kind of a mischievous, uh, smart guy since uh, that time, but now he's in Shenzhen, and he works in a factory, and he has this uh, relationship of trust with the people there. Amongst all the people that I know, he's most knowledgeable about the Shenzhen ecosystem, and he has also the uh, engineering capabilities to make hardware. So he's a very interesting hacker. So please listen to his talk. Um, thank you for having me here in Tokyo. Um, I really enjoy being here. And thanks for the very kind introduction, Joey. Um, I, you know, I think I'm here because um, I like to make stuff. Um, and as Joey had mentioned, I had uh, actually uh, hacked the Xbox at one point in time. And you can see sort of this little flow chart of my life in one page. Um, when I was about uh, 12 years old, I started by uh, hacking my uh, remote control car, and I connected it to my computer so I could play with it. Went to school, um, did some mischief with the Xbox, uh, got into chip design, designed computer chips for a while. Um, then I designed some uh, photonic circuits. Went to a startup called Chumbi. This is where my sort of consumer electronics uh, background came into play. I learned how to do manufacturing, got introduced to the Shenzhen ecosystem. And now today, I'm an uh, independent sort of, uh, I call myself a boutique hardware um, sort of design uh, person. Uh, and I have a few projects right now. Uh, I have a studio called, called uh, Sutajo Kosagi, um, Bunny Studios in Japanese. And uh, I build products like my own laptop, which I'm using to give the presentation here, and a little uh, uh, project we call Chibitronics. I'll talk a little more about that, where we make uh, sticker electronic circuits so you can integrate electronics with papercraft. And I do this with a student at the Media Lab. So uh, my big concern lately has been about crossing what's called the gap. And the gap is, what is the, dif the distance between the first prototype made in a laboratory. So on the left-hand side here, we have a picture of uh, a, a, the sticker circuit prototype that the student at the Media Lab had made uh, with her own hands, the hand soldering and assembly of, of the first unit. And the question is, how do you go from that to not necessarily a huge scale production, but how do you get to a reasonable scale where you can involve a conversation with a larger audience? Right? There's only so many people you can bring to your lab and just show how to uh, build a circuit. But if you can actually turn it into a, something more closer to a product and build a few thousand of them, then many people can get involved. And the research becomes a different, uh, evolves into a different sort of uh, entity. Um, and, in, and just to talk a little more about uh, the gap as, as, uh, as it's been perceived, there's a... Uh, a common wisdom uh, out there that in order to make hardware and for you to make money on hardware, you need to invest millions of dollars and you need like hundreds of thousands of units to sell to be profitable, right? Uh, the picture here is actually of a phone. It's a simple phone that was made in Shenzhen, uh, but it's made for children, right? There's only four buttons and an emergency button so you can call your parents and maybe your sister and that's it. And it prevents you know, the children from being distracted by their phone in class, right? You want to be safe but not you know, be a toy. Uh, this kind of phone is, a, is, is what they call a niche market. Like it's, not a, it's not a very, not, not everyone can use it and it's a kind of a risky thing to produce. Um, and so if someone were to do this in, say, for example, the United States, they would need to raise millions of dollars and they'd have to sell hundreds of thousands of units to make money. But in Shenzhen, the cost for doing something like this is under $50,000. And they can be economical in production scales of 1,000 to 10,000 units, right? So these people can cross the gap 
from what may be considered almost a, a, a strange idea, a phone just for kids with four buttons only. They can't even really make that many calls, um, but they can make it economical in this ecosystem. And so the question I've been trying to answer is, what ecosystem makes this possible? Right? How is this, how is this possible? Um, the area that I do most of my work in is called the, the Pearl River Delta. It's the, the larger, we, a lot of times people refer to it as Shenzhen, but it's actually a, a larger region they call the Pearl River Delta. Uh, in 2007, there was about 40 million people there, like about, about a third of the population of Japan, uh, and they had a GDP of a, a, a half a trillion dollars. And it's, it's remarkable, this area in 1980, had, in Shen, this is a, on the right-hand side, is a graph of the population of Shenzhen, also from Wikipedia. In 1980, Shenzhen was 300,000 people. In 2011, they were 10 million people. Uh, it, the city grew basically out of nowhere. Uh, when I told my parents the first time I was going to go to Shenzhen, they said, You're no, you don't want to go there. It's a fishing village. There's nothing. There's, you know, it's, a, it's a place for criminals and whatever. And, uh, and when I went there, it was just this huge city that came out of nowhere. Uh, and, and, and even the you know, people who were from China didn't expect uh, this kind of growth. Um, the ecosystem consists of uh, several mega factories, really huge factories that employ a million people, uh, factories uh, with names like Foxconn and Huawei. They make products uh, for Hewlett Packard and Apple and many other brands, also Sony now. Um, and these mega factories, um, you know, started there, and what they created around them was thousands of smaller factories that no one talks about because they're too small for anyone to really recognize. They're about a thousand to ten thousand workers in in the facility. Um, but these factories are specialty services to service the larger beast, right? Uh, if you have a CNC machine and need it fixed, you need someone who has the ability to fix your factory equipment. If you need basic components and supplies, you need people who can su supply these. And so once you have this sort of diaspora, this, this ecosystem of, of smaller factories, it makes it even easier for you to start more big factories. So this tipping point that the ecosystem can reach to create this very dynamic um, uh, sort of society. And so it was actually very, I was actually kind of glad, this is a slide from Joey's presentation, the keynote this morning, where he talks about Lemoore, and she's very proud of her pick and place machine. He explained there's a machine that can be used for automated assembly of electronics. Um, and the, the cool thing in Shenzhen is that this is actually a very typical scene. You're driving on the highway, and you'll see on the truck next to you a pick and place machine going to another entrepreneur like a Lemoore somewhere else in the ecosystem. And it, it, it's, very, it's very casual there. It's not like they even bothered to put it in a special box or whatever. They just sort of load it on a truck and they put tape on it to hold the parts on and they just ship them back and forth between these smaller factories in the ecosystem, right? Um, and when you have an ecosystem that's this dense, what you find is actually you start selling capability and not inventory, right? And, and to illustrate this point, let's consider an example of a USB cable, right? So on the top left there, I have a picture of a, oh, there's a laser pointer here. There's a, there's a USB cable here, right? Everyone's familiar with this. If you go to a Yodobashi camera and you tell the store person, uh, I want a 1.7 meter USB cable, please, right? He'll be, okay, strange that you want something so specific. And he'll show you the section, and you'll probably only find 1.8 or 1.5 or 2 meters, but not 1.7 meters. And then you explain to the store clerk, please, I want 1.7 meters. Can you make it for me? I think he would laugh at you out here, right? But when you have an ecosystem closer to the right-hand side where people have uh, raw wire and the connector parts and the machine to put them together, when you want a 1.7 meter cable, they just turn a knob to cut the wire to 1.7 meter and the machine can make it for you, even quantity one, 
it's possible, right? The answer is not no anymore when you need something more custom, when you have an ecosystem of people who can make things uh, versus when you're so far from the factory, all the factory can do is create final finished goods like finished USB cables. The answer is oftentimes no if you want something that's custom. And many people who live in areas like Tokyo or in the United States, you're so far from the point of production that um, it seems impossible to contact the factory to ask them to just change the length of a wire, something so simple. But in Shenzhen, in that ecosystem, because you're surrounded and you're living in this ecosystem, that answer goes from no to yes, because these people, of course they want to sell more units. If they sell you even one cable at 1.7 meters, that's 1.7 meters less wire they have in inventory and a dollar more they have in their pocket. They're happy to help. So in order to facilitate this ecosystem, a key ingredient is uh, efficient discovery. How do you find this capability? Right? Of course, if you go to a, a place that makes batteries and you ask them for cables, the answer is no. Right? You have to find the place that makes the cable. And for them, it's just as easy as turning a knob for 1.7 meters or 1.8 meters. Right? Uh, and what I've done is these are some satellite pictures of uh, the electronic district in Shenzhen. So this, they call it the Huachang Electronics District. I've roughly outlined in the box the size of their district. Here is uh, Akihabara, when that's sort of the train station there. And, and in that area, there's a, a little area. I don't know if it still even is that popular anymore, but they sell parts, the Radio City, and the transistors, and, and these things. It, it's more sort of anime and cosplay there now, I think. But um, the, in, in Shenzhen, because they have thousands and thousands of manufacturers and, and warehousers, um, they, they fill out several city blocks, and these aren't just small buildings. They're like, you know, there's an 88-story building or there with, you know, full of, uh, you know, vendors and distributors. There's, you know, just rows and rows of buildings. It's very large. Um, and, and this is what a, a view of a typical inside of one of these markets might be. There's many, many uh, small stalls. Each stall here is a representative of someone who's trying to sell a specialty, the LEDs or cables, or sometimes they represent factories. And so when you go to them, you talk to them, and, you, and they show you what they have. If you don't see what you want, you can say, can you please make this? And I'd say about half the time, they say, sure. How many do you need? Oh, 20, 25. They say, give me one week, and we'll have it for you, right? And that, that, that becomes the answer. The answer becomes yes, because it's so competitive. There's so many people trying to be discovered, trying to get new business. This is a, a kind of a typical view of inside of one of the stalls. Just, it's sort of oftentimes a family business, a little bit sort of ramshackle, not very professional looking, right? But on the back here, uh, if you've done production electronics, you recognize these are uh, reels of components. Each of those flat round things have 10,000 capacitors or resistors on it. These people are dealing with volumes that you could then take to a phone factory that makes a million uh, per month and then plug them in and actually produce. So even though this looks very humble, the, the, they're, they're, very, they're very serious in terms of the volume and the business that they represent. Um, and that whole area that I was outlining there actually operates more like a gray market. It's not uh, a well-regulated market. Um, the goods there are not always new or even in good condition. Uh, but it actually, the fact that such a and you know, some people would say it's a bit illegal what they do, but the fact that something uh, so f flexible exists is actually very important in the hardware world. And the reason is that uh, uh, forecasting your demand is very hard. If you have a phone that makes a million phones per month, you ask your sales and marketing team, tell me, please, uh, how many units should I make this month? They say, I don't know, a million, right? But if they're even off by 1%, that's 10,000 phones, excess production, right? And then your margin is actually still only a few percentage. Uh, and in, in consumer electronics, it's, it's sort of like a net sum zero gain. So in other words, when one model becomes popular, someone else is buying another model, OK? Uh, it actually turns out that if you go line by line in terms of the number of parts in the phone, 90% of even the new model phone is the same as the old model phone. They're very similar, right? They all have the same capacitors and screws and 
small parts. There's some custom parts, of course, like the core, like CPU and whatnot. But even the memory chips can be transported across generations. So what happens is that when one factory's production is ramping down, they have this problem of too much inventory. They keep it as parts, and they actually use the gray market to liquidate the inventory and get it into the new model phone, maybe per perhaps even through a competitor. But this informal ability to go ahead and liquidate and, and, and to um, sell goods in a very flexible manner is very important uh, for the ecosystem. And people like me who go out there can also take advantage of it. You, I don't have to be a big factory to buy. You can come just as a person and buy. And then the prices are very low. Um, of course, there are risks in gray market. This here is actually a very, also a very typical scene in Shenzhen. This person here is taking phones and recycling them. So he's picked them out of the trash. And he's, he's pulling the circuit boards out. You can see he has a wire cutter there. And uh, he's going to later on take the chips off, clean them, and sell them as new. Right? Uh, now, the funny thing is actually this, these chips, because chips don't really wear out. They're good for a decade or two. Uh, actually, these are, in some ways, you can say now, well-tested components. And so they can be even more reliable than ones that are brand new, in some cases. right? It's, it's a little funny. But, but actually, the question of, like, is, are these things I'm getting in the gray market, are they new, are they usable, there's always, of course, a risk. But this kind of risk is something that you have to take, uh, I think, to survive in today's uh, business environment. So I have some examples of, of using the ecosystem. Um, so every now and then I like to do small projects that are just more for the fun of it, but just to sort of um, to see if I can, if I'm actually performing at the benchmark that these people have set. And so, for example, here is a conference badge I made. Uh, it has a radio, a light controller, and a sound sensor in it. I only made 30 of them, and. Uh, people at the conference bought them, and we sold them for 40 US, 4,000 yen, and it made money at that price, right? And this, this is all in. This is including the setup fee and the R&D fee. So, these, so actually, we made about 60 total. We used up 10 for testing, and 10 of them didn't work. We still made money selling just 30 units at $40, right? So this is, this is an example of what you can do using that, that ecosystem. Or another example is actually the, this presentation. It's hard to see, but uh, over there is a, a, a strange laptop that I'm using to give the presentation. I made my own laptop uh, using an ARM CPU and other parts. And we did a, a campaign around it. And we got about 500 people who are interested also in this laptop. And if, you, if, I, if I were to go to Sony and say, hi, I'd like to make a VIO. Uh, and I have a, it's a concept, and 500 people may buy it, right? It would be, the, the answer would be no. It's not possible, right? There's too much investment, too much engineering, too much effort. Uh, but this ecosystem is low cost enough that we're, we're going to make a, not a lot of money, but we'll make a little money uh, being able to do this. And we also learn a lot in the process of, of designing these things. So the question is, is Shenzhen a, a role model city? I mean, this is also not an uncommon scene. You have this wonderful, ultra-modern office building next to, I don't know, some residential place where you know, it doesn't look very well kept. Um, Shenzhen is really more of a self-organizing chaos. Um, the, the city is organizing to the people. There is some concept that there are zoned areas for manufacturing and office or whatever, but no one pay, pays attention, right? There's plenty of office buildings that people live in, plenty of uh, residential places use office buildings. Now here is, you know, in the market, there's just kids playing with the random garbage on the floor. Um, I, I, it's hard to see here, but they're actually taking cell phone parts and they're sliding them across the ground and sort of racing them uh, around like their cars or something like this. But this is actually not an uncommon scene in these markets. Um, and, and the kids are there because it's a weekend, and the parents have to take care of the kids, but they also want to work, so they bring the kids to work. This happens all the time. It's a very natural thing for them to do. It's a very sort of self-organizing chaos. Um, it's very important. I think one of the key things that, and when people ask me, how do we copy Shenzhen and Silicon Valley or something like that, a key thing that Shenzhen benefits from is a critical mass a critical density 
of suppliers. Um, and this is the critical density is a point at which the markets are no longer selling you parts, but they're selling you capability. That whole analogy I had about the USB cable. When you can go into a place and order exactly the length of USB cable you need, and the answer is yes, then you've replicated Shenzhen, right? Until that point, you're still, you still have this layer between the makers and the factories of distributors and this distribution network, and that uh, causes trouble. Um, and this whole layer came about, in essence, as part of the, the issue of dealing with market risk, this whole gray market. Even though it's, you know, it's a great capability for discovery, one of its primary roles is, is the liquidation of inventory between different businesses. Um, one other thing is, is, as Joey also mentioned, that the, the factory uh, bosses will eat lunch with the factory workers and so forth. This is, in, in part, an artifact of the fact that almost every factory, um, in order to keep their labor costs low, provide housing to the workers, right? So when they build the factory, the land is relatively cheap. Uh, you'll have a facility that's so big, and then about something about the same size next to it, where all the laborers go, uh, to rest, and this is a picture of the, um, all the workers um, going to lunch uh, inside their dorm area uh, during the shift change. Um, and by providing sort of the housing and the meals, it, it, it reduces the load on the uh, transportation. Like if all these people had to commute to their job, it'd be very difficult. Um, I heard actually a, a story once from someone who uh, worked with Foxconn at Apple that the, uh, the primary limiting factor for them building more iPhones was that the buses could not get people off for shift change fast enough. And so Foxconn had custom buses made where the front of the bus comes down so the workers can come out entirely through the front instead of through the door. And so then they could make more phones, right? And so, and so this is, this, these kinds of problems become real issues uh, when, you, when you have masses of labor. Um, it's also, uh, Shenzhen is not just about uh, manufacturing, but also there's many foreigner-friendly districts, so people can come from far away and feel at home and to transact business and to, and to have a good time with friends. And I think that's also an important part in every city to have an area that can accommodate, you know, uh, people coming from far away. And then, uh, I guess another thing I would want to know about the areas that, you know, one of the reasons people attribute Shenzhen as being the way it is is that it's technically sort of in a free trade special economic zone. It's close to Hong Kong, which is a port city. These, these things are true and it makes things better, but in practice, uh, the Chinese don't enforce the rules consistently. Um, and even, for example, just this past uh, Chinese national holiday, basically no one was able to export boxes from China for about two weeks. Everyone was telling them two-week delay, two-week delay. Uh, and this is right around holiday season, so it's, it's even more urgent. Um, but these, these things happen in China. So it's not like it, it, it's working perfectly, but still, despite all this, uh, the ecosystem exists and thrives. So finally, uh, just a few observations um, about you know, sort of Shenzhen and me being a maker there and the things that uh, I think are most important from a city is that if you're in a business like physical good manufacture, you're building like physical items, um, this benefits from two things, scale and locality. Um, a, the informal and liquid markets help stabilize the ecosystem. If, if it's not, you can't have it too rigid, you have to have some flex and ability to be able to whether the sort of the seasonality of electronics. And the other thing is that hardware is hard. I mean, I, I mean there's a sort of notion that the hardware is a new software or whatever it is. It's not easy. It didn't get easier for any other magic than the fact that um, when you have a very dense ecosystem, you have a lot of expertise. You have a lot of people who are exactly the experts at exactly the thing you need, and they're all within about a one hour car ride of each other. Um, and so there's a high supply of domain-specific expertise that you can use, and that makes your life easier in terms of building things. You know, just, it's all half the promise finding the right expert. Um, and then my final point is that at the end of the day, I, I think that governments can try to steer uh, an ecosystem to become like this, but ultimately it's the entre entrepreneurs who drive this economy, right? The Shenzhen is a success story, but no one likes to talk about the dozens of failures uh, that also exist. There are many free trade areas 
in China that did not succeed. And in fact, if you drive around the Shenzhen area, uh, you see other people trying to start competing electronic markets, right? They want, the Huachan Electronic District is one of them, but every like, locality wants to have that sort of beating heart of commerce in their city. And so they create these huge buildings uh, and they give subsidized space and they try to pull people and they want to, they want to kickstart that critical mass. And, not, and few, very few people can replicate that. But uh, at the end of the day, when, you, when the conditions are just right, and I don't, I don't know what those conditions were, but when they are just right, you get this perfect storm of scale and entrepreneurs and people come together and, and you can give, have a very uh, thriving economy. So thank you, Joy. Yeah. The other day, I went to Shenzhen with Bunny. And what was most interesting was that uh, at those factories, they copy products or, and they follow uh, the technology of Japanese uh, electronics makers and other companies. And uh, talking with them, uh, I found that uh, they were very knowledgeable, much more knowledgeable than us. The, uh, Honda's first factory, uh, well, there, I was talking with the person who made the first factory, and when he went to Detroit, he took a measure, and he m m uh, measured, tape measure, and he, uh, he measured everything and uh, copied everything to build his uh, first fact factory. Uh, so they're trying to uh, uh, catch up, uh, and then, uh, then when uh, you exceed, uh, and uh, uh, I think uh, in Shinsen, uh, I had the image that uh, uh, they are trying to catch up, but uh, they have exceeded us in some parts. And through uh, Bunny, I have learned uh, that uh, there are excellent uh, engineers, and we're bringing them to MIT uh, to grow them into uh, entrepreneurs. And so that's the project that we have. And the uh, next person, or next speaker, is uh, Connor. He's also alumni of the uh, uh, Media Lab. He started with a computer interface, but now he ha heads the synthetic biology company. And in that sense, uh, he naturally moved from a computer to uh, biotechnology. So I think he'll talk about that uh, in terms of his history. I talked about biology earlier. And uh, recently, when I visit companies, what I feel is that 20 years ago, when I was talking about the internet, people would say, oh, we leave that up to the IT department. It's got nothing to do with me. There were many people who felt that way. But now, if you don't know, uh, about in if you don't know uh, enough about the internet, you can't manage. So it's the same with biology. It's not uh, whether you need to know biology. It's all about when you start studying biology. The most advanced biology is going to change the world. So you need a certain level of literacy there. So, listening to Connor's presentation, you might uh, start to ponder uh, when you might uh, start to take up studying biology. Hi, I'm Connor. Thank you for um, inviting me to this amazing event. This is actually my first time in Tokyo, and I've wanted to come here ever since I was a little boy. So this is a great experience for me, and I hope that I'll be able to enlighten you guys this afternoon. So let's talk about biotechnology today. Biotechnology is an exceptionally important technology. That's where we get some of the world's most important technologies, including food, fuel, medicine, and materials. Um, when you combine these sectors, you realize that it equals about 2.5% of current U.S. GDP and is expected to double to 5% uh, U.S. GDP by 2020. And if you look at the numbers for Europe, uh, U.K., uh, Asia, they're following similar trends. Um, so, so this kind of is an interesting uh, forecast because when you look at biotechnology products today, they typically cost billions of dollars and take a decade before they can come to market. So one of the questions that somebody might have is, well, where is this growth coming from uh, if the technology takes such huge resources to get going? Um, and the answer to that is uh, synthetic biology, of course. And to get into some of the, the uh, what synthetic biology is doing to biotechnology, I'm going to talk a little about what happened in another uh, tech boom, um, and that's in IT. And of course, we'll be speaking about Moore's Law. 
Um, and for those that don't know, Moore's Law is the idea that computing power doubles roughly every 18 months or so while maintaining the same price. So year over year over year, computing power grows exponentially. Um, and, and this has been an amazing thing for us. We've all experienced what's happened. Um, if any of you were lucky enough to use a computer in the 1960s and 1970s, uh, uh, chances were that it took up an entire floor of a building. Um, everyone you were working with had a PhD in computer science or at least a master's degree in computer science. And you're probably working at a bank uh, or a government or, or likely the military. Um, but you know, with Moore's Law in action for, for these decades, price and performance uh, w was getting much more competitive. And by the late 70s, we saw a, a radical paradigm shift in the advent of the personal computer. And I've got a, a photo there of the Apple I. And you'll notice that I show a picture of the computer from the 60s, and there's one of them. And I show a photo of the Apple I from the 70s, and there are many of them. And that's because you know, they cost just a few thousand dollars. They were accessible to a much larger audience. And so as a result, uh, we saw new types of people buying operating and programming these computers. We saw designers, artists, uh, parents, teenagers, uh, schools, students, all different kinds of groups started to get into the computer revolution because of uh, uh, the accessibility of the technology driven by, uh, by Moore's Law. Um, and as a result, you know, we had a whole new uh, um, group of people that were writing software. And they had a whole new set of problems that they wanted to solve. And of course, they were applying computer technology to solve these problems. So uh, I show in the photo there uh, an image of an early computer output from the 60s, which would be something like a, a military lookup table for uh, firing programs or for uh, uh, mapping data. And then, of course, today you realize that there are uh, hundreds, thousands, uh, dozens of thousands of software developers that are out there today that are creating applications uh, that are a little more frivolous by 60s, 1960s and 70s standards, but today um, we can't live without them. Uh, so of course Angry Birds is a huge uh, billion dollar franchise that is uh, software that's written that is, is not uh, uh, too difficult to implement. Um, and the good news is, so we're experiencing a, a similar, if not better, uh, disruption that's happening in biotechnology. And this is really being driven by uh, automation uh, in biotechnology. And so um, our capabilities today in uh, manipulating DNA uh, is, is breaking Moore's Law. It's beating Moore's Law. Our capabilities are getting uh, uh, growing faster than exponential in this case. And that's thanks to, again, automation in things like DNA sequencing, DNA synthesis, uh, and the proliferation of software. Um, and so I'll, I'll have a, a photo here that kind of shows where we are today uh, in biotechnology where you have large uh, corporations, uh, pharma, uh, agri, uh, oil, that spend millions of dollars on, on uh, biotechnology labs. And again, they're staffed by PhD level uh, researchers that take months and years and quite a bit of resources to, to bring one of their products to market. And this is changing now. Things are becoming automated. Things are getting into the hands of uh, uh, different groups of people, uh, again, thanks to um, technological advances. And you know, the question is then, OK, well, if today you know, we have our, our biological products, what are going to be the blockbuster biological products of tomorrow? And I think it would be a lot of fun to, to brainstorm on that for a few hours. But uh, you know, imagine uh, you know, in five years an Akihabara of, of biotech uh, popping up somewhere. And so let's take a step back and talk a little bit about what synthetic biology is. Um, so synthetic biology is the idea that DNA is software, that DNA is the code of life. Um, and with today's capabilities, uh, we have the, the power to read in DNA from an organism. So for example, we could take a sample from a red rose and get that DNA sequenced. When we have that DNA sequenced, at the end of that process, we have a digital file that exists on a computer. It's literally a text file that contains the DNA source code of that red rose. Once you have that DNA source code on your computer, uh, you can have a lot of fun with it. 
You can manipulate it using all the great computer tools that we have. Uh, you can drag and drop, cut and paste. You can email it. You can send uh, uh, biological code at the speed of light to the other side of the planet uh, for just pennies. Um, but what happens at this stage is people will actually do their genetic engineering inside the computer using tools. And of course, as it's virtualized, the cost plummets to the point where it's, it costs you almost nothing to uh, engineer DNA in a computer. I mean, you have to buy a computer, but everyone's got one already anyways. Um, but once you have uh, got that DNA in your computer, uh, let's say you have the, the red rose DNA, and you take a piece of code from uh, a, a purple violet, and you insert the code for the purple violet, replacing the code for the red rose into the rose, and you think there, okay, well, maybe I've got a new type of rose that could be purple instead of red. But another step needs to happen. Uh, you actually need to get the real DNA manufactured. Um, and the technology is available already. It's called DNA synthesis. You can think about DNA synthesis as being very similar to a 3D printer. Uh, but instead of it printing out a, a, a plastic uh, um, object, it prints out a real uh, double helix piece of DNA. Uh, and this, you know, you, you, you send your uh, file to this machine and it prints it out and then you've got it in your hand. After you have that, you then insert that into uh, a rose and, uh, and then grow it and see if your project worked. We're not at the point yet where we can say for certain at the design stage that this is going to work. There's still quite a bit of trial and error. But this process that I just explained uh, takes on the order of weeks and might cost you $1,000. Uh, versus uh, a year and a million dollars and five or six PhDs uh, working to do this. Um, so the next question is, well, who's doing this? And we have a, a photograph here um, that's basically a picture of the globe. And each one of those points represents uh, one of the many thousands of users that use uh, the Symbiota platform, which is our suite of tools. And you can see that there are points on all seven continents. And this is really exciting for us because it really shows the interest in this technology that's coming from uh, just general people. Um, so we've been around for, for just about a year now, um, and the response has been really positive. And there's a, there's, uh, th this group sort of self-identifies as uh, do-it-yourself biology, or DIY bio. Um, and this group of people have been around uh, for five or six years now, and there are dozens and dozens of these self-identified groups of biohackers and biodevelopers and biotinkerers that have popped up in cities all around the globe. And there's one particular group that is a, has a quite an interesting story. Uh, they're called La Payasse, and they are from France. And um, uh, Thomas Landrain, who, who's pictured there coming up the stairs, he was a PhD student, and he got a knock on his door, and it was the police. And uh-oh, you know, he thought, what have I done? But he didn't do anything. The police were asking for his help. They said that they uh, found a, uh, an abandoned office in Paris, and it was filled with thousands of dollars worth of biotechnology lab equipment. And they wanted him to come and take a look to say, to, to comment on, did they just discover a, a derelict uh, a drug manufacturing den or, or, or bioterrorism or, or what's going on in here? And uh, so, we, so we got there. And long story short, it turned out that it was actually a forgotten uh, uh, office um, that did environmental testing for Paris. So it turned out it was the government's office that they forgot about, but it was abandoned. Anyways, they said, what should we do with all this equipment? Uh, he said, well, tell you what, I'll, I'll take care of it for you. Don't worry about it. And so he jumped on that opportunity. He rented a cube truck uh, the next day, picked it all up, and drove it to a squat in the south of France underneath a derelict uh, old garage by the train tracks and put it in there um, uh, where, where he grew a, a group of people that uh, included uh, software hackers, hardware hackers, and, of course, biohackers. Um, and they started working on projects, uh, and they started to get noticed. And it got to the point where uh, the mayor's office of Paris realized that, hey, these guys are doing good work. We're looking to really promote the entrepreneurial community here in Paris, so let's actually give these guys a big grant, bring them down into downtown Paris, get them a real office, a real lab, where they've continued to work on amazing projects and are getting in Wired magazine and, and all these sort of things. Um, and so, so that's sort of like a great poster child example of what's coming up from this, this bottom-up uh, group of biohackers. But it's a really unique case. 
not every uh, DIY bio group out there is so lucky that they can uh, get thousands of dollars worth of equipment uh, by luck. So what, what's left? What, what do the other groups do? Well, they do what they can. Uh, and the easiest thing to do is uh, get access to software and start building things uh, uh, at a software level. And so what you see here is uh, a software tool that we released um, uh, open source in uh, the spring of 2011, uh, where my co-founder and I, we were working at Mozilla at the time. And this is a, a, a web-based tool that allows people to engineer, edit, design pieces of DNA. Um, and it's, it's relatively straightforward to use. Um, but, but people were using that and it was fine and, and we continued to, to, to build these tools because we realized that uh, to do real bioengineering, it takes more than just editing a DNA text file. You actually have to, to make things happen in the real world. And so to that end, we partnered with another Canadian group called Genomicon uh, who are making what's called a, a wetware kit. So, uh, computers are referred to as hardware, computers run software, and in the biotech world, uh, uh, anything that is instantiated in the real world, uh, we, we like to call it wetware. It's a pretty cool term. Um, I don't know if, if professionals call it that, but that's what we call it, and we think it's pretty neat. But this is a, this is a kit here uh, that we make and sell that comes with real pieces of DNA that are configured in such a way that allow you to assemble them uh, in about an afternoon. And by assembling these pieces of DNA in different ways, you're able to create a custom uh, a DNA code that you can then put in a microorganism. In this case, it's E. coli, a lab strain of E. coli. And you can instruct that organism to uh, uh, produce various colors. So red, green, blue, yellow, glow in the dark, uh, all these things. Um, and this is sort of a, an educational tinker type of kit. Uh, but it's an example of where the technology can go. And uh, so in, in addition to that, we have also created um, uh, social tools that allow people to use the common uh, DNA development tool that we've provided, the common wetware platform that we've provided, and work independently, but then share their results, uh, which is uh, sort of bypassing what is typical in uh, the biotech world or life science world, where scientists will work in their individual labs on their own, uh, they'll do research for a number of years, uh, and even if they have a fantastic result, uh, they still put time and effort into writing a paper and trying to get that paper published. Once they get that paper published, then there you go, they've, they've had a success. And one thing that we're trying to do is get people's work actually out there so that other people can leverage it uh, uh, very quickly because we feel that the value uh, in what we're doing comes from creating the real product, uh, not, not only uh, creating a, an academic uh, journal paper. Um, and so finally, we have uh, uh, created another tool that's sort of like in early stages right now to, to support this, this network of performers that we have, and that is, uh, it's a bio app store. It's a marketplace where people that are using our tools to design new biological uh, solutions can then bring it to the app store uh, where other people can trust that it's coming from a good place and that it's a quality product and be able to s sell that or buy that and, and either use it or leverage that in their own research. So it's this sort of ecosystem that we're, we're really starting to create and, uh, and jumpstart. And so there's a, there's a case study that I can talk about. Uh, we, we initiated a, a program earlier this spring called Science Hack. Um, and Science Hack uses a custom wetware kit that we developed in partnership with Genomicon, which is called the Violacin Factory. Um, and Violacin is interesting because it's a, it's a research compound right now in, in the medical world. Uh, it has promising anti-cancer capabilities, promising antimicrobial capabilities. Um, uh, the issue is that it's only available from one supplier, and this supplier sells it uh, uh, for you know, $350 million per kilo. No, nobody buys it by the kilo. Uh, they buy it by milligram, but it is very expensive, and that means that it's, uh, it's very scarce. It's not in the hands of researchers, so research in this place, uh, in this space, goes very slowly. Um, so we thought that we would apply our technology to see if we could make this uh, interesting uh, uh, material abundant for, for an inexpensive price. Um, and so what we did was we created this kit and made it available for sale, and about 20 groups around the world have bought this kit and have started to build it, 
share uh, their results with other kit owners, and then those other kit owners then go back and tweak their research in an effort to create a, uh, a microorganism that produces the most amount of violacin uh, per unit of, of input food that these microbes eat. And uh, as a result of this, Forbes uh, earlier this year called this science hack project the most ambitious distributed science project. And uh, hopefully I'm, it'll live up to that. I, I'm pretty sure it will. Um, we have very compelling results that are coming out that we'll be publishing in the new year, uh, but so far so good. And so one thing that's interesting is uh, that, that because this technology is so accessible, um, were, as, I, as we saw in computing, a lot more people from different backgrounds are getting involved. So this photo here is of the first cohort of people that participated in the Science Hack project and built a violation kit uh, uh, device. And so there's a, a group of about 20 people here. Three of them uh, have a formal training in biotechnology, life science. The remainder are made up of artists, designers, uh, computer hackers, uh, photographers, journalists. Um, it's quite a ragtag group of people, but each one of them were able to contribute uh, to this project. They weren't just uh, participating as, as spectators or bystanders. They were each uh, creating their own designs, building their own designs, and testing them. Um, and we actually saw that as a theme going forward with each uh, new uh, science hack that we did uh, it started to attract a lot more people. And, and to be honest, um, most of our fans come from design and architecture and computer science rather than coming from biotechnology, life science. Um, I, I, it's just a hard nut to crack with the life science people, but uh, hopefully they'll start to see a little bit of the writing on the wall. And uh, so the, the final question I have is like, who's, who's watching this? Who's taking notice of what's happening in this new space? And uh, one of the, the more exciting uh, opportunities to come out of this is that uh, um, venture capital firms um, like Y Combinator or IndieBio, which is a, a part of a group called SOS Ventures, uh, these are VC firms that have for years now um, invested uh, a startup capital in software companies, companies that are making apps, companies that are making uh, hardware, uh, but generally things that are related to the information technology realm where they feel comfortable in investing. Um, you know, because as I said before, biotechnology products uh, generally could cost a billion dollars and take a decade to come to market. But because we're starting to talk about biotechnology in, in a similar framework uh, as, as software development, uh, these groups that are comfortable in investing in software are starting to feel more comfortable investing in biotechnology. Um, which is really exciting because we're starting to get not just uh, groups of ragtag people around the world who are tinkering and, and working on solutions that are interesting to them, but they're actually able to raise capital um, to make those projects a reality. So for example, this summer, uh, uh, there was a, the first cohort of synthetic biology um, uh, entrepreneurs came through a program called IndieBio, and uh, they accepted uh, six groups and uh, four of those groups came from the Symbiota network. And they completed their four months, and, and uh, they were able to come up with some, some products, and some of them were still in the research stage. Uh, but that didn't stop them from receiving follow-on investment, um, uh, close to almost $3 million between the three groups that got money. Um, so it's really exciting to see that kind of confidence and backing in, in such, a new, uh, such a new realm. Um, and finally, you know, we have uh, um, security and health and defense groups that are starting to take note because they uh, um, are interested to see the new types of capabilities that are available to, uh, to just anyone that has an interest. And uh, I had a chance to meet with groups from the FBI and the Department of Defense and Department of Homeland Security and all these, these groups, and it was frightening to meet with them because I've never really met with them uh, before, um, but it was exciting to find out that each and every one of those groups was just as excited about what's happening in a space as we are, um, because they, they feel that there's a lot of opportunity going forwards, um, and they, I think they've learned some lessons in the past where uh, they're, they're not trying to uh, stop technological development because it's not possible to do that. If they try and stifle it in the United States, it's 
going to grow somewhere else, and that means the opportunity is going to go somewhere else. So they are taking uh, um, an approach of support. Um, and if they're offering support that's valuable, then people will come to them. Um, and, uh, and that's exactly what's happened. So in the summer of uh, 2012, uh, they held an international summit of uh, the DIY bio community in Walnut Creek, California. They invited the heads of all these different DIY bio groups. They paid for their flights and accommodations and flew them all to California, uh, uh, where we were able to have, have some discussions. But what was really exciting about that is that they did the community a real favor because it was the first time that groups from America, Canada, Europe, and Asia were able to meet physically in person, shake hands, and talk about what we wanted to do. Um, and so it was an amazing experience, and uh, it's, it's just really exciting to see that everyone seems to be on board with this technology now. And uh, that's um, the end of my presentation, and hopefully I didn't speak too quickly. Thank you. Thank you, Connor. As I listened to his presentation, I felt as follows. I went, uh, we went to about a big business the day before yesterday and talked about uh, biology. And uh, I was uh, having fond memories that when we have just started. Um, when we discuss about uh, the internet at the eBay here and uh, elsewhere, they don't know what to, have to, to use them. Uh, there were times like that uh, before. But the people who, uh, who thought that uh, we will be able to bring change uh, to the world and we here have tinkered ourselves. The same goes for biotechnology. There are also the possible applications, but uh, the, what we are looking forward is that these young people will get together using such highly advanced technology. What would be the applications to come in the future? I am so excited. Even though you do not have uh, the clear image yet in your minds, I'm sure you will have great expectations going forward. The next speaker is uh, Kevin Slavin uh, the, from our own MIT Media Lab. For more than 10 years ago, he was with uh, a advertisement agency. He was a game creator as well. And for many years, at, I have been uh, the member of uh, the Board of Trustees uh, for uh, the Knights uh, Foundation. And with the foundation asking him, uh, he has created a game centering on cities. For editing media, he is very skillful in editing media, and very recently I have asked him to become professor of the MIT Media Lab, uh, the biotechnology, the hardware, uh, and other cutting-edge technologies. Uh, he is indeed well-versed and well-experienced. So please look forward to his presentation. Great. Hi. Let's see. So, um, so this is... Uh, what you see here are um, a juxtaposition. This is the, the Z80 Pac-Man code. This is basically all the computer code that uh, is Pac-Man. And then that's the climbing gym where I used to go in Brooklyn. Um, and somewhere in between those two systems, between uh, Pac-Man and some guy who can't get up the wall, uh, that's sort of um, where I live. Um, there's, um, there are 28 groups at the Media Lab, uh, and maybe 25 of them, let's say, are focused on um, making the world um, more efficient in some way. And uh, at, my group is sort of focused on whatever the opposite of that is, um, uh, to figure out not what the optimization and efficiency look like, but what imagination and delight uh, can be derived from things, um, to sort of um, change the world in a way by changing how we see it. Um, and uh, as Joey mentioned, I come from, uh, in part from a games background. Uh, this is uh, 1850s. This is the science fiction writer H.G. Wells. Uh, he used to play these games on his floor, uh, which is a really weird idea uh, if, you, if you think about it. Um, and it, uh, what you see in this is the idea that the, that the entire city could be brought into the living room somehow. The idea that you could compress the world, even in the 19th century, down into one tiny space that you could somehow engage with and play. And for about 10 years, what I've been interested in is what happens when you turn that upside down. Um, 
when you say, let's instead take the city uh, and use that as something that you play. Um, so about 10 years ago, I started a company with a, a game designer named Frank Lance. And uh, we sort of just set out to explore this idea, um, could we rethink what cities are and do, um, not by how we work there or how we live there, but by how we play there. And so we did a whole bunch of uh, sort of adventures in this. One of them was very directly inspired by uh, a visit to Tokyo about 10 years ago. Uh, this was the first time that a QR code was used in North America. This is about 10 years ago or so. Uh, and it was, it was actually for a game. It was for a game that took place in American cities, um, but not like, a, not like a treasure hunt, but like an actual game, uh, thinking about the city in terms of specific territories that could be captured. Um, the way that you capture a territory in this particular game is by moving your game piece into that area. Um, your game piece, in this case, is about 25 foot high inflatable animal. Um, this is what it looked like to play the game. This is what it looked like. Uh, this was a challenge. Um, and this was sort of a big success and, and opened up a very different way of sort of seeing the world um, and a, way of different, a different way of seeing the city um, that it could be something other than commercial or residential, but also playful in some way. Um, and that you could change the way that the city works by changing the software. You don't have to change the hardware or the buildings. You could just change how all that gets used. And in a way, you know, we didn't, you know, of course, invent that idea. It was really just the technology allowed certain things to happen. And there were two maps that we always had in front of us. One of them about the possibilities, which comes from the past, and one about sort of the sadness uh, of the contemporary reality. And what comes from the past, this is 1958, and this was a group called the Situationists in, uh, in, uh, in France. And they were interested in an idea called psychogeography, which was the idea that somehow um, the conditions of the city, the physical conditions of the city, had fundamental emotional and psychic effects within the human mind. Uh, and that you could begin to kind of hack that in ways that they were sort of starting to explore in the 50s that ultimately led to uh, riots and um, maybe less interesting things uh, than, than, than one would hope. But uh, it was the idea uh, really going back over 50 years of saying the city needs to be something that you play in some way. And then the reality, and this is a, this is a map from 2007, and this is, a, this is Sheffield in England, but it could kind of be any city almost any city in the world. And what it's mapping is four generations of, uh, in one family where at eight years old, how far could a child go? So the great-grandfather in 1919 could walk six miles in Sheffield to go fishing. And uh, his son, Jack, as they moved further into the suburbs, was able to walk one mile into the woods. And then his daughter, Vicky, was allowed to walk uh, about half a mile. And her son, and I think this is true in almost every city, in almost every country, her son at this point, in 2014, is allowed to move about 300 yards, about 300 meters uh, on his own. And that transition from a world in which we walk six miles to go fishing to walking uh, 300 yards because somehow the world is dangerous represented a challenge for us of how to if we can't make the world broader, could we make it deeper? Could we provide new ways to understand and engage with the world that you're in? And so we made some of the first games that ever used real-time GPS. This is a two-player game uh, in New York City, the sun player and the moon player. That third one in the center is Papa, Papa Bones, who's a ghost, not an actual person. Uh, this is what it looked like on the display your only move in the game is actually to move. We just tracked your location, and as you move through, you're capturing intersections uh, of streets. The sun player is a real person. The moon player is a real person. And as they move, their icons move. But that ghost player doesn't really exist. It's just pixels on the screen. But if he touches you, you, you die in the game. Um, and what that means is, is that this is what it looked like uh, to play the game. Um, this is what it looked like to play the game. 
These are people who are running down the street who are being pursued by something invisible. And this was the world that we wanted to make, uh, and a world in which we could bring invisible forces to life and have them somehow in interaction uh, with the world that we live in. Uh, this is uh, just, we're working on this now at the Media Lab. This is a game uh, with the student Greg Bornstein uh, called Case and Molly. This is based on uh, a novel by William Gibson called Neuromancer. This is a two-player game in which one player can't move. They're totally immobilized, but they can see everything that the other person can see, and they have access to all this information. The other person can move as much as they want, but they have access to no information at all, just a very thin line back to the immobilized player on the left. And this weird tension between somebody who is immobilized but can see everything and somebody who can go anywhere but knows nothing uh, is maybe something, has something to do with contemporary life, maybe. Um, and this idea of really treating the, the, the poor ways that we interact as something to celebrate, as something to work with as material, that it's not just, um, it's not just a deficiency, that the constraint of that becomes something that we can use as material. Um, the thing about game designers is, is that constraints are really the material that they work with. Games become uh, more fun with more restrictions in them. And so this becomes the thing that we can sort of play with. As we've uh, as I've sort of begun to think about where these things go, this becomes, in a way, one of the more interesting aspects of it, is how to connect people to people in these new ways uh, that, that have a very thin line. And so these ways of connecting people to people uh, start in my own work in part from a project that we did in Tokyo about eight years ago uh, that was using, uh, it was when uh, Purikura was still uh, a popular thing uh, here in Tokyo. I think it's not so popular anymore. Uh, but we used uh, these stickers that people were making of their faces and some uh, surplus Israeli surveillance software that was designed to look for the faces of bad guys in the world. And we combined those to make a game that was about putting up your face around Tokyo and photographing the faces that were up. It was this sort of uh, tiny Tokyo uh, of faces that were somehow in a, in a playing with one another. Um, and this is what it looked like uh, as a visualization of how people became connected through this. They would never meet. They would never become friends. They're not, uh, they're not now bound on Facebook in some way. But in some way, they touched uh, here in Tokyo, even if it was just through a phone to a face on a, uh, on a wall, that somehow there's that, that tiny, tiny new way of connecting actually changes how you see all the faces around you, if it works. Um, and these are some of the types of connections that I'm most interested in. The work that Joey referred to earlier uh, for the Knight Foundation in the United States was some work that we did of building games for cities to figure out how to get those cities to engage with one another uh, in, in sort of new ways. This was a game that we made for the city of Macon, Georgia, which is a small city in the American South. There's not a lot going on there. Uh, and you have two populations who move through it uh, absolutely parallel to each other, like a, an episode from Star Trek or Ghosts. Right? They, they hardly see each other. And so we built um, not a game, but a playful experience for them by introducing a new currency. The new currency was called Making Money. And we didn't distribute the actual currency. We distributed bonds to redeem it, except that each person only got half of the bond and had to find their other half somewhere in the city. So these are two people who had to find each other in order to get their currency uh, that was good within the city. And this was very successful in bringing together uh, people who had no other way to interact, but also no other reason to interact, um, to begin to understand that, in fact, uh, their parallel worlds were, were, were on the same plane in some way. Um, and that was, uh, that was really all it took 
with people was a playful framework in order, to, uh, in order for them to connect. Uh, this is, uh, I'll show you a project that we're working on right now at the Media Lab with the Dalai Lama Center as part of MIT uh, that sort of takes this one step further. And I, the easiest thing is to show you the video. Um, and there is sound on this if you can do it. But don't worry if not. OK, we'll do it without. Yeah, okay. So this is a prototype right now. We have about 100,000 people who are signed up, who are ready to use it when we, when we roll it out. Um, and it really comes from two insights. One is, is that these little computers that we have in our pocket can know so much about us without having to do anything at all. Just by having it on and by carrying it around, we can learn a lot about your habits. We can learn. Uh, where you are, we can learn what time you wake up, what time you go to sleep. Um, the types of places that you go reveal a lot about what type of a person you are, and all of that without you having to do anything at all. And that this is used right now to serve advertising or for surveillance. And the question is, could you use that for something else? Could you use that for delight? And the other broad trend is, is that we have these tools and these technologies that allow us to connect to anybody in the world, but that increasingly, the way they get used is to make the world narrower and narrower. That the, that the tools that we've developed have become uh, most proficient in keeping us uh, focused on the people that we already know in some way, which is so contrary to what these tools were supposed to do, in a way. And so, 20 Day Stranger says that what we'll do is take all the information that we can gather about you as you go about your life for 20 days, connect you to someone who you will never know, who you will never meet, who is not your friend on Facebook, uh, who is not like you in any way, probably, and say that your lives are going to intertwine, to say that you have access to the habits and ideas and, and places of somebody else's life, and they have access to yours. And this idea that says that what, what these tools can do is take you out of your own life uh, for a moment, for, for 10 minutes out of the day, uh, I think is sort of the, the, the deepest unexplored potential uh, in everything that we, that we see. Um, so lastly, what we're doing is sort of thinking about how do you sort of take that further? And I think one way to think about it is to say it's not just about connecting with other humans at all, but really with a broader sense of the planet, uh, a broader sense of the environment around us, uh, to nature itself. And I'll start with a, an older project from about seven years ago, which was a game called Shark Runners. This is a game that you play in the browser in which you have a ship and you are looking to have your ship intersect with a shark. Uh, so that you can dive and study the shark. And uh, it's, this, it's a very slow game. Uh, it will take about six and a half hours for that ship to travel uh, 100 pixels to the left. And if you sat there and watched that, it would be the most boring video game in the world, which is ambitious uh, to try to make. Uh, but so what you would do is you would set your course, hope that you intersect with the shark, and if you do, we would call you and let you know that you have intersected with a shark. You have to go back and do a dive. And the headline of the game, the sort of magic in the game, is, is that all the ships in the game are controlled by the players, and all the sharks in the game 
were actually controlled by white sharks in the Pacific Ocean that had GPS transceivers stapled to their dorsal fin. So what you have in the game is a bunch of people who are playing a game with a bunch of sharks who probably don't know uh, that they're playing. Uh, and there's that kind, of, um, that kind of magic that happens that we, that we saw for the first time there of something that's real and natural in the world kind of folds into your everyday life. Um, that you get a call in the middle of a business meeting from a shark in the Pacific Ocean. Um, these are the types of connections to the world that I think um, we're just beginning to unpack. We're just beginning to, to explore. Um, but there's actually, there's life much more interesting than sharks, um, and it lives all around us and inside us. Um, uh, this was a game that we made for the Museum of Modern Art in New York uh, that is a, it's a card game uh, that is about $700, and you have to send us a vial of your spit. Um, and we would take your spit, and we would take the DNA, we would extract the DNA from that, and we would generate your deck of cards based entirely on your DNA. Um, so this particular player has diminished pain. Uh, this person has straighter hair. And these things produce certain advantages and problems within the game. The truth is, is that some of the decks are, are better than others, and you have to play whatever you get, um, like, uh, like everything else in life. Um, so the idea that a game could be produced out of your DNA was sort of uh, one of the initial thoughts about this. But I think even there, you can go further in that your DNA is, um, is, is only a narrow idea of who you are. That really, um, to think about who you are as a human is not just about uh, your genetic material, um, that you can think about it as broader systems that are, that are interacting in different ways, whether that's bacteria or different types of systems of the body. Uh, I'll show you, this is work very much in progress uh, this is a sculpture that we're making that'll be about uh, uh, maybe about 20 feet uh, wide. Um, and this is some of the beginning sketches that show the 11 systems of the human body, the circulatory system, the skeletal system, the respiratory system, and to actually bring them to life using bacteriological interactions, to actually bring those to life and create a sculpture that does everything that the human body does without having the brain. And to think about what it is to really be human, uh, that it really is, in a way, uh, it may be uh, just the interaction between these 11 discrete systems. And to think about sculpture and art as a way to begin to actually imagine this, because it's so hard to imagine it within your own body. So these are, these are just some initial sketches. Uh, these will be glass uh, with, uh, with live bacteria inside. Uh, this is the respiratory system, which is pulling uh, air and water out of the building up top, uh, passing it through uh, the endocrine system, uh, and ultimately uh, the skeletal system, which is excreting cellulose so that the skeleton of the sculpture gets thicker and thicker, and it, it's a sculpture that, that grows, that, that lives in the strictest definition of life. And is also in uh, interaction not only with itself, but with, uh, with the room that it's in. Um, but what's inside us, uh, you know, the idea of the, of the sort of bacteria inside us and of these systems, in a way, that's the least of it. And uh, this is the last project I'll show which is we're just starting now. Uh, this is a collaboration uh, with, uh, with Connor, who just, uh, who just spoke, uh, with Symbiota in Toronto, and a group of very talented designers uh, in London who used to work at a company called Berg. When Berg, uh, when the company in London was working a little while ago, they pioneered the ideas that Somehow there's this invisible energy around us. It looks like Wi-Fi. It looks like radio signals. It looks like GPS. 
and we take it for granted. It just sort of is, it's in the air, like oxygen or nitrogen or whatever. But it's not. It actually has its own dynamics and patterns. And they began to build a design language uh, in order to allow us to see that. So this was, uh, this was work that they did that allowed us to begin to see the uh, Wi-Fi signals and the ways that they are affected by the structure of the buildings that they come out of. Um, that it's not abstract. It's not that Wi-Fi just sort of moves out. It has, it has a structure. It just has never been visible to the human eye. And they've done a series of explorations about how, how to think about this. You know, um, what if every uh, radio transmitter in the city what, you know, presented in a visual way the field of energy that it was producing around it. And this is important and interesting work uh, to begin to imagine, to begin to not imagine, but to begin to see this invisible world around us. But what they're revealing, I think, isn't nearly as interesting as the other invisible world. Um, the other invisible world looks like biology. Uh, it looks like nature. And for perspective, it's this idea that there are 10,000 more microbes inside the human gut than there are humans on the earth. And that the idea that humans are somehow special or at the center of this starts to fall away. Uh, and, uh, and that's just the microbes that are on the inside of us. When you get to the outside, we're outnumbered uh, even in a far greater way. And so the question is, how do we imagine this invisible parallel planet that we're completely dependent upon. And right now, in general, in general, the way that we imagine it is publishing papers in scientific journals, in general. And I think that the opportunity, and this is where we're just starting to, 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 to think about how to make this real, is to use the kinds of design language that we've just seen with Berg that were used to see Wi-Fi or radio or GPS, and to use the same types of language to allow us to see the invisible world that's around us right now. When everybody leaves here in a couple hours, we will all leave parts of ourselves uh, involuntarily. And uh, somebody would be able to tell, in part, where everybody was from, uh, just from the transition uh, of uh, bacteria that make their way from inside you to the outside simply by fact of being alive. And the question is, what happens, and it will happen, when the city becomes visible at that level? What happens when we can start to see certain types of bacteriological interactions with the city in ways that we could only have imagined uh, 100 years ago? Uh, Machia amarensi there in the center, uh, which is released um, uh, at the very, very beginning of spring. Um, could, we, could we make that visible? Could we know that spring was coming because buildings change color or because a scent is released into the air? And this is sort of the path that we're going down. It's to say that the work that the situationists were doing in the 1950s when they talked about how to reinvent the city and how the city determines our psychological sensibility um, is sort of, we can, we can start to unlock that in totally new ways. The impulse is as old as cities are, uh, and it's as vital uh, to our uh, survival uh, as, as, uh, as cities are. Um, but the ways of expressing this impulse are totally new. Um, and just this idea that the invisible things that are chasing us, or the invisible things that we're moving towards, can now be things that we reveal in the world instead of things that we make. So I'm super excited to see what that's going to be, um, hopefully here in Tokyo soon. Uh, and thanks, everybody, for uh, inviting me to this. It's been an amazing day. Thanks. Thank you very much for that. We'd like to start the panel discussion. So uh, the speakers who have just spoken, could you sit up on stage, please? The panelists are asked to proceed to the stage. Thank you, Kevin.
So we'll do this part in English. <laughs> but, and also feel free to ask each other questions as well. I don't need to do all of the, uh, the question stuff. But, um, but I think sort of, you know, wh one thing that I talked about a little bit during my keynote, but also you all touched upon in slightly different ways, is um, ecosystem. You know, so there's the ecosystem of the city, there's an ecosystem of the community, and I think a lot of um, what's, so what's interesting for me is, and one of the questions in, that um, Takenaka-san showed was, should cities be planned top down with a master planner, or should they be emergent, right? And when we think of ecosystems, you know, every one of you has a little bit of designer in you, but you're also messing with systems, right? So either playfully or you know, genetically, or, and you're working inside of an ecosystem that you may or may not have control over or influence over. But I think one of the key questions, and I, I was actually on a, uh, in a study group in Japan of the, um, um, it's called Kokudo Kotsu Show, which is the, uh, the, the ministry that's in charge of land. And um, they were trying to figure out how to make creative cities. And all of the really creative cities that we found weren't intentional. Whether you look at Soho or whether, you know, they happened despite government efforts. Um, and, and it was really difficult to figure out how do you, how do these things emerge? And so, I'm, so there's two questions here. So one is, you know, can you design or influence ecosystems in a way considering how unpredictable complex systems are and, and, and how do you think they, they emerge and become vibrant communities like your D DIY bio community or, or Shenzhen or, or, and I think, um, Kevin, you're, you're doing it slightly more intentionally, but, but you're still messing with things that you don't control. I don't know if you guys have any. Sure, I'll, I'll say something. This is this on? Um, uh, I, I found in, in not just in our biological work, but uh, in life in general, what seems to work is, you know, creating an environment that is conducive to an outcome that you're looking for. And, you know, once you set that environment up, um, you know, you, you set your seeds to grow and see, and see what they're going to do. Um, but you, uh, to get the best results, you need to be there to nudge uh, at the right place and at the right time. And if you uh, understand how to do that, um, then I think your chances of success are high. And the way to understand to do it is to look at other people's examples. Um, otherwise, uh, it's an experiment. So I, I, think, um, I think one of the main, one of the main shifts in, um, in, in urban planning in general, among other disciplines, is the shift from really uh, planning top down to uh, revealing something from the bottom up. Um, uh, that, the, that, the, that the shift comes from having an idea uh, that's going to be imposed, uh, like uh, Brasilia, uh, you, know, a, you know, a grid that's going to be laid down uh, without any regard for the, for the conditions around it? Um, or uh, are there going to be new ways, uh, which, which currently exist and, and are at the edge of existing, that allow us to, to understand what's already happening and to kind of augment and amplify the parts that we like. Um, and I think that's the, in a way, that's the, that's the most interesting thing for me. Mm -hmm. And I mean, like you were telling me when we were in Shenzhen that even though it's kind of out of control, there definitely was some things that the Chinese government did to enable that, right? Right, yeah. I mean, I, I think that there's a lot of um, infrastructure that has to be put in, like, subways don't emerge as an emergent property of people getting into an area, right? Uh, but the subway system is absolutely essential, and that requires planning and foresight to make those happen. And creating districts that are conducive to the people to gather and for ecosystems to grow is important, mm -hmm. right? But, you, but the problem is, is you don't just need the district, you need the people, too, mm -hmm. and the incentives. Um, and part of the challenge is, is that you're dealing, it's, it's like, you're, like you're, tr you're trying to control the flow of water. Water always flows downhill, right? You have to make energy to make it go up. And kind of what you can do is you can see where you're getting stuck, water's pooling, and maybe you know, adjust and make, optimize the flow. But you, you have to have the water, and you have to have the combination of things to make it all happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
And I think one of the, I mean, because we look at this place, or Rapungi Hills, and, and they're very designed and very intentional, but they work well, right? And it, and it, and it feels to me like they, there, there is design that's intentional and well done. And we live on this funny fringe. Like, for instance, one of the things that we discovered in our study of, of artists and interesting areas of town is you have to have a price point. It's like your water thing. If it's too expensive, cool people won't move in. I mean, it's usually the, the starving artist that moves in first that's then followed by the hipsters, that's then followed by the restaurants and the food and, and so on. And, and in, in, in New York, you just have this chasing game of the artists running away and the gentrification chasing them. But, but, but it seemed to me that almost the single most important factor above anything else was at low cost of land, right, and the availability of some space. And so, so I think what's kind of interesting also is kind of what are the parameters? And to your point, there's a water and gravity, that's sort of one, it's a metaphor, but, but is, is something changing that's making it, like maybe some of your invisible things, but what's changing that it makes it harder to do things intentionally right? Or is that, or is that the wrong, is that the wrong, is, is that not true? Because most of the interesting thing, stories that you talked about, except for maybe a little bit of some of Kevin's, were sort of emergent, right? Like your, your, your hackerspace in, 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 in Paris. It, it, it turns out um, we have the former mayor of Paris. He says, oh, I did that. So <laughs> some synchronicity here. But, but, but also Shenzhen, there's, there's a lot of randomness. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, I live in Singapore, which is very much a planned city. Um, and I think one of the continual frustrations they have to deal with is that, is that they're very well planned and things always work out well, but they tend to get a lot of mediocrity. Like, nothing's bad, but it, it's not this explosive growth of creativity that you see in these other areas. And part of it is I think that things have, are so tightly planned that there isn't the room for the, the things that the planners overlooked to, to take root and to grow, right? So it's not that, you, that if you just took 40 million Chinese people and then threw them into a valley and said, you know, build, build cities, it's going to happen. It's, that, that also is the other extreme. You have to have some planning, right? Mm -hmm. But you also, I mean, I think part of the reason why Shenzhen is sort of succeeding in some areas where other places have struggled is because they did have infrastructure there was some foresight, there was some plan, they did create a free trade zone, um, but then also all those people came as well. And so you just can't, but if you, you look in other places in China, they've done exactly the same thing, right? You have the, like these places with like billion dollar subways and like 10,000 people to use it or something like that. And that also doesn't work, right? So. Anything else? Move on to another question then is, um, so, so you, you're sort of hardware, but there's the Shenzhen hardware thing that you were talking about and the bio thing that you were talking about, and, and, and now Kevin's talking about. I mean, it seems, I wanted to sort of discuss how hardware makers enable bio makers, and, so, and, and the extent to which those communities may or may not be coming together. Um, and and where, where is that community emerging, do you think? Well, I, th I think there's, a, you know, in the, in the early days of the DIY bio movement, um, there was not a lot of actual biological work being done just because access to the tools was severely limited. So, I mean, if you're looking to buy off-the-shelf biotech equipment, uh, it's, you know, $60,000 for a particular, particular unit, uh, that, that's, that's the standard cost. And so in the early days, people were building tools, uh, hardware tools first. And one of the most famous ones uh, was a, a tool called Dremel Fuge. And this was basically a, uh, a centrifuge made out of a Dremel and a 3D printed uh, attachment that you know, would cost you five or What's six Dremel? dollars. What's that? What's Dremel? A, a Dremel is a, is a high RPM handheld cutting tool. Um, it's like a it's like a drill, it's like, with, a, it's like a drill, yeah. but it's not in gun format, uh, and, it, and it spins very fast. Um, and so, like a a, a proper uh, centrifuge is five thousand dollars, six thousand dollars easily. Uh, the Dremel Fuge was something that was going to cost less than a hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. You might injure yourself with it, and uh, it's not not as good quality. But uh, a, a tool in your hand is the best tool to have, um, and so that was sort of kicked off the idea. And since then, people have building other open tools, like an open PCR machine. Uh, one of the more exciting tools that I've seen 
uh, uh, that's coming down the pipeline shortly. It's a, uh, uh, a desktop-sized liquid handling robot. It's going to cost about $2,000 versus $60,000. And a tool like this uh, basically is a lab automation tool, which means I don't need to have all of the manual physical skills that are required for the pipetting. It's, think about it as um, very high-end cooking. Um, I don't need those skills. I, I need a credit card, and uh, I buy that and put my protocol on the robot and come back the next morning, and the work is done. Mm -hmm. um, that kind of stuff is really, uh, really helping. There was... Um one of the things that I was uh, reminded of when, when uh, Bunny, when you were showing uh, sort of the recycling of the chips and so on is, is that there's the biohacker space in New York called GenSpace. And I remember when they were first, when they were first sort of starting out, what made, the, what made it possible for them to, to have even simple equipment in the lab was that equipment was, was changing so quickly that proper bio labs would just upgrade everything all at once and then just dump you know the equipment like the you know if you are if you're a proper biology lab the last year's equipment is useless right. and if you are uh, a, a biohacker space uh, that comes up on eBay uh, which is where they which is where they bought all their equipment and that and that that sort of that cycle uh, of of, uh, of industry that sort of throws off uh, something is is an important part of 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 progress overall, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and I think that yeah. I, I I'm sorry I keep drawing parallels to the internet because it's like that's <laughs> that's what I am. But um, I think what's important to me about the internet was that just lowering the cost was what enabled open source software and enabled all these things. And at the high cost, you just couldn't do any of this. And similarly, I think it's the low cost for artists and the low cost for biotech and the low cost at Shenzhen that allows people to experiment in ways that you couldn't do if it was too expensive. And the high-end people benefit in the long run, like the internet in our hotel rooms here. Or it, but, but a lot of this stuff, and there's some sort of relationship between innovation on the edges and, and that, that the quantitative difference of low cost has a qualitative difference in the way, the way that, we, that we innovate. And, and, and I kind of want to ask you just as, a, as an artist, mm -hmm. You know, because I think Nanjo sounds there, um, and we talk about this sometimes, is the, the relationship between like fine art, big A art, mm -hmm. and little A art, and, the, and, you know, and street art versus, because we have, you know, again, the, one of the most prestigious art museums here, but then we're talking about doing stuff on the street. And how, how, does, how does that, do you have an idea of how that connects? And, well, I think, and if it's a, is there, is there a trend shift or? Well, I think there, there's these two weird parallel trends, which is, you know, one is, is that if you look at, if you look at what's happened to the, the, the industry of, of art, uh, uh, capital A art, um, you know, art uh, is more expensive than it's ever been relative to any other uh, index. But that has, I, I would argue, that has, very little to do with cultural priorities and has more to do with the fact that as an asset class, it's difficult to tax and regulate. Um, that, that, you know, as wealth moves further and further up the line, uh, it looks for uh, places to park itself that live as far out of a regulatory system as possible. Uh, and art is very, is very good for that. And that that has little to do with cultural priorities, but at the same time, um, the ability of let's say, lowercase a artists, or, or artists that just aren't huge yet, um, the ability uh, for people to understand their work and their ideas is completely, it's without precedent in human history. And, um, I, you know, I think there's, you know, there's a, there's a very interesting uh, startup out of New York that I, that I work with a little bit um, uh, called Electric Objects, which is a, it's a computer for art. Uh, and it's for the first time a distribution system, a screen uh, uh, that can go in people's homes that as an artist you can publish to. Um, and I think, I think the idea uh, that um, it's a little bit like what happened to music. There are fewer superstars, let's say, but there's a lot more music being made and a lot more music being enjoyed. And I think this is, you see this happening with art. And I think the, the other thing that's that's happening now is the thing that has always happened, which is that artists will use 
anything that falls off the back of a truck. And the things that move on trucks these days are really, really interesting things. Um, and so, you know, the reason that uh, there was a, the reason that there was a movie industry in New York, uh, basically from the 60s on, was because of surplus military 16 millimeter cameras that were being, that had been sort of thrown off uh, from, from the war, basically. Uh, the reason that video artists uh, uh, happened is because those, because video cameras started to fall off the trucks. What's falling off the trucks now uh, are, you know, centrifuges. You know, what's falling off the trucks now are huge components of parts. And so the things that we're starting to see don't look like anything we've ever seen before, and that's what artists are supposed to do. Like, artists are still doing all the things that they're supposed to do, which is to, which is to see the future uh, a little bit sooner than everybody else by picking up the things that everybody else has, at this point, taken for granted. So. And you, you find that in hardware, too. I mean, I, I, like, we, you know, for instance, we're at the Media Lab, we're starting to do a lot of augmented reality. Mm -hmm because little tiny projectors, we call Pico projectors, have suddenly dropped in price. We don't know exactly why, but now they're cheap enough that it makes sense to put on glasses. So that suddenly it exposes a whole new field of play in, in terms of technology by just the change of price of one component. And I think in Shenzhen, that's what you're doing all the time, is you're sort of scouting for things that have suddenly become reasonable as well, right? right. Um, and, and I think that that's, and again, I think that's the kind of interesting th thing about this, which is the, the economics feels like it's about trade, but it actually impacts quite dramatically, um, I think, innovation as well. Um, I, I have some of that polling stuff. Let's, I want to see if I can you know, wake up the audience a little bit and do a poll, and then we can get some stuff to talk about on the panel as well. Um, let me see if I can get them to get the polling thing ready. Eto. And these are kind of mean questions. Um, um, but one, one is, um, and, and this is, I, I point this at, at, at Japan a little bit, because in Japan, but I guess in the US too, I mean, you're kind of forced to choose um, a lot between, are you going to go into math and science? Are you going to be creative? So, um, but, but if you had to pick, which would you improve? Um, Science and math, creativity, art, or it's fine as it is now. So, So, if you could please vote. Hi, just on the Thank you. So, can I put? Uh, can you put the the result on the screen? Creativity. Well, that's good. Um, and it's interesting, though, because it seems like everybody thinks the educational system needs to focus on that most, but it seems to be actually the hardest one to measure, uh -huh. right? Yeah. Because, and we like to have educational systems where we have measurements. Um, but well, let's talk about this. Uh, let's finish the... Uh, the, the, the um, then next one. Uh, okay. Um, so, and this ties to the previous discussion. Who, who are the most uh, important people for influencing the design of a city? Is it the uh, most important influencers in designing cities? Should it be the government, urban planners, artists, business, scientists? And I think this is changing too. And this kind of helps determine which track at this conference is the most important one. <laughs> All right, can I have the results? Oh, interesting. Let's see. So we've got definitely not the scientists, not us. <laughs> <laughs> and not you, Nanjo-san. <laughs> That's interesting. So businesses, that's, that's interesting. So businesses are number one, and, uh, and then it's urban planners, and then government. Interesting. Right? One. Okay. Is this the end? Was there another question? 
Okay, so this is, this is sort of a, a parallel of an earlier question about science. Is synthetic biology, will it be good for society? Yes, no, I don't know what synthetic biology is. <laughs> and then we'll scare them after this question. And that's fine, then can I have the results? Interesting. So I don't know if you were here for the morning session where it was whether science would be good for society or not. Almost everybody said yes, and there were like 10 people who said no. But there are a lot more people who are afraid that it's going to be bad, which I think makes sense, right? And then there's a... Can I have the percentage? So... so 30% don't know what it is, so maybe we should describe what it is a little bit more as well. Um, but let's, let's, I mean, let's go, I want to sort of go backwards on this, because I think this is actually a, a key thing that we've been talking about, which I think, even though it may, might be repetitive, I think it, it's sort of one, one important message, because in, in some way it feels like we're hyping it, that we're sort of promoting synthetic biology, and it feels a lot really like when I was talking about the internet and everybody thought I was a con man, right? Um, but it's, and, and there are risks, right? I mean, one of our, our good friends, George Church, who has a, a, a appointment at the Media Lab, um, he feels there is a significant risk that somebody will accidentally make a virus that will kill every single human being an extinction event, you know, and that to the point where he's, 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 he's looking in, he's working on personal biospheres to protect things, and he thinks we should send people to Mars just in case everyone on Earth dies, and, and this is one of the leading geneticists in the world, so, so obviously it's not without smart people feeling a tremendous amount of risk, um, so in a way I think it has some of the most um, opportunity of anything we've ever had, but it also has the most risk. And then there's also the, um, we were, I mean, just to be fair, I mean, we were talking about kind of the fun, shiny stuff, but when we start thinking about modifying our own genome, um, so there's a technology recently called CRISPR, which allows you to edit your own genes. So there's a startup company now that will scan the embryo of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a family and it will look for um, mutant genes and fix them. Okay, and that's, it's not, it's still a startup, it's not finished, but that's the plan and they know how to do it. Um, that sounds not so bad, right? Mutated genes, fix them. But it's the same technology you would use to edit a gene to make somebody different, right? And then you start to get into all kinds of ethical discussions. Should you be allowed to modify the genes of your unborn child to be different from what nature wanted. Or, and we talk about working closely with nature, but synthetic biology in a lot of ways is about being able to mess with nature. Um, and uh, one famous, again, George Church said, well, it's the end of evolution because now we're designing, we're gonna be designing human beings. And so I don't know what you guys feel about some of those questions. I mean, this is really your thing, but, but just to say that, that you know, there's this idea um, uh, that Eli Pariser came up with uh, regarding the internet of, this, of, the, of the filter bubble, um, that the ability to get, to customize your experience of information uh, has, has, has basically collapsed uh, uh, the ecosystem of, of information into these weird poles that no longer has like diversity uh, within it uh, because everybody wants sort of their version of the thing. And, you know, the idea of, uh, uh, you know, of a biological filter bubble uh, uh, is, is plausible, right? You know, which is, which is uh, you know, the moment, the moment you can customize, you do, uh, and there will be cultural forces that, that, that sort of guide that. Um, uh, I, I, you know, I think we're a long way off from the, mm -hmm. from the reality of that, but this is, this is your world, yeah. yeah I, I think we're a long way off from that reality as well. Um, and, you know, all those concerns that you raised are concerns that uh, 
I came across and, and felt that I wanted to learn more about as well. And, and really the, the best way to learn about this and to be as prepared as possible is to know how the technology works, uh, even get involved in uh, using the technology or trying to shape the technology. Um, and you know, when we first started working on Symbiota, the, the early kernel of that was in, in summer of 2010, um, it took about two years for me to be able to get into conversations with people without them immediately raising mm -hmm. uh, you know, existential threat uh, questions. Um, and I mean, that is of concern, but I think you know, if we ever get to the point where we have the technology where it'll be easy for somebody to create an existential threat, uh, I think it'll be the same technology that will be easy to combat that existential <laughs> threat. Um, that's, you know, usually technology and, and, and if you're talking about a weapon, they go tit for tat with defense. Um, usually. And, <laughs> yeah, and, and I think, by the way, I wanted to add one thing about the editing the genes thing, because I think some people may, uh, the, 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 the fact is that um, just like we were talking about complex systems, if you modify a gene, you have all kinds of side effects. So, for instance, there was a, a gene that somebody modified to figure out how to make you live longer. It turns out that that side effect is it causes cancer. And so, for instance, to change your height is hundreds of genes, each one with possible side effects. So you would never try to make your kid taller without years and years and years of research on all the side effects. So, so I think what's important to understand is, to your point, it is a little bit long ways off in that Specific mutations that we know about cancer and things like that are single genes that we are, you can revert to how it should be. That's easy. Trying to make somebody smarter or more beautiful or taller, this is, has is so much uh, work before we're going to get there. Having said that, you know, five years ago, editing the genes, people would have said it were impossible. But here we are and we can do it. So the, there's two forces, right? One, which is it's a lot harder usually than we think but then some things suddenly become really easy and unpredictable. And I, I think, I mean, one of the major drivers of this technology is the fact that, you know, as humans and life on Earth, we're born and we have to grab hold of all the diseases that already exist on this planet, the viruses, diseases, and every, everybody in history has already, uh, ha has died at this point. Um, and, you know, this synthetic biology technology and, and all the stuff around it is probably one of the best tools that we have mm -hmm. to combat things like uh, cancer and terrible viruses. Um, and, and, and I like to look at it like that, uh, or sometimes compare it to cyberspace, for example, which is just an agreement between all of us, and we let it hurt people. We could all unplug whenever we want to, um, but we don't. And, you know, there's computer viruses that are made by us, mm -hmm. and I think that, um, uh, you know, if we, as a population that are generally good people, if we work together, um, you know, we're going to use this for good. And so that's one of the reasons why uh, on our platform we encourage people to work at in the open um, and with the idea that they can share their data and other people can learn from it as fast as possible so that people know what's going on. And, and I think you made a point um, in your presentation that uh, um, by making it open, I mean, it, making it open, we can see and learn. And I think what's important about this is, like, I never said the internet was a good thing. I always used to say it's coming, and you can't go backwards. So you might as well figure out how to survive. And I think it's the same thing with synthetic biology. Like, I don't think immortality is going to be a good thing for us. I think it's possible um, in the future uh, realm of possibilities with synthetic biology. I think we should think about it. Um, I actually think it's probably bad. We have, we, I know a lot of people who think it'll be great, um, but I think it's gonna be the rich people who yeah. become immortal and not the poor people. So, but I think the point that I'm making is that you have to talk about it. And in order to talk about it, you have to do it. Yeah. And I think that the idea is that you have to kind of do it in the open. Otherwise, it's gonna get pushed into secrecy and into um, people who probably shouldn't be the ones making those decisions. I mean, think, think about how much, <laughs> how much damage we've done to the planet and to ourselves by accident, you know, just but through ignorance and naivete. And it's very hard to imagine that we could outdo that by doing something intentionally. Right. I just I, I think the damage that we could possibly do intentionally is nothing compared to the damage that we've already done by being idiots. Right. So, yeah. And, and, and I think that uh, one of the, the, the things that's very hard to assess about 
sort of biology versus sort of like the robot revolution that we always envision, that robots will build robots and they'll take over the world, is that actually nature doesn't like us very much, right? There's lots of things that want to eat us and consume us, and there's billions of them out there constantly evolving to try and make themselves you know, dangerous to us, right? More so than one person in a lab can possibly come up with. And so it, so it sort of goes to this whole uh, argument over genetically modified crops mm -hmm. and are they dangerous to you somehow? It's like, well, do you think that these plants actually want to be eaten? They actually make poisons to keep you from eating them. And in fact, us editing them to make them more docile and stuff can actually make it better for us because it's not natural. Right. But even that's a metastable meta state. These things will tend to actually reintroduce traits that make it more difficult for us to eat them because they don't want to be eaten. And also, I think a lot of the modifications have been done by businesses. And one of the surprising things for me was that the fact that the businesses were number one on who should be planning cities. Because to me, I mean, we, I, we run businesses, I'm in businesses, I like businesses, but businesses and markets are not very smart. You know, um, they cause financial collapses. They tend to try to have, they're very greedy. They try to become monopolies. They try to get local gain at the expense of everybody else. They're very competitive. Um, and you can have, and, and I guess Japanese companies are slightly different because Japanese companies tend not to focus as much on the shareholders and more on employees. And, and we, we talk a lot about companies being involved in, 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 in the environment and things like that. But, but I, I personally don't trust companies to um, have common good as, as a as a thing, and, 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 and in fact, when we think about competition of ideas, artists have this natural competition of ideas, science has a natural competition of ideas, but I think that companies tend to have a competition that we see right now in the real world. I mean, my real world fear is markets tend, especially after internet, tends to lead towards monopolies. And, and I think monopolies just aren't, usually don't look out for the common good. I don't know uh, what you feel about the sort of, I mean, and, and with genetic modifications, I mean, companies modify crops to make more money, not, not to help people or to create right. biodiversity, right? Yeah, yeah I, th I think that's right. In, you know, many conversations I've, I've had with people where I've introduced them to the idea of synthetic biology, um, you know, sometimes they, they say, oh, that sounds like genetic engineering, and I don't like genetic engineering, it's really bad. And, and I like to ask them, well, what, what is it that you don't like about genetic engineering? And when it comes down to it, what they don't like is that they don't have control over it. It's under the control of a large corporation. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, I like to say, hey, you know, get involved and make those, you know, larger, older corporations mm -hmm. irrelevant or, yeah. or at least gain the same kind of power yourself. And, and I think the first market that has allowed the genetic modification of human genes um, for fixing um, genetic uh, illnesses is Europe. And so George Church is always making fun of saying, Europe has genetically modified humans not eating genetically modified food. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think that's, that, that definitely is, I think we have this with all kinds of science where I think we just sort of label clumps of science as bad. And I think genetically modified things, we just have this view, whether it's because of lack of control, because companies have done weird things. And I think that's also... Uh, risk because what it does is it pushes a scientist underground, right? Um, I think most scientists who work in synthetic biology don't like to sit in front of people and talk about stuff because they're afraid that they'll say something that people will mistake, fear, and regulate against. Um, and we see from things like climate change in the United States how politicized science can become. And that was the other surprise that I had is the lack of <laughs> a role that scientists had in cities because I think, I think that the, the role of science in society is, is, is extremely important. But right now what I think there's a huge gap between what's going on in science and what people know. And that chart showing that most, like 30% of people didn't know what synthetic biology was is not so much a problem about the people. I think it's the media. It, I think it's, it's, it's society that isn't talking about what I think is the most important thing that we should be talking about right now. I mean, one thing that's happening in the United States that I, I just have an eye on is that um, there's a, because funding for science has uh, dipped so substantially uh, in recent years, there's a, there's a glut of scientists. There's like, like we have way too many scientists who don't really have a specific thing to do. And the last time that that happened was when uh, they closed down the 
superconducting super collider in Texas um, uh, during Clinton. Uh, and all of a sudden you had all of these physicists, you know, like thousands and thousands of physicists who'd been working on some of the most difficult physics problems in the world. Um, and all of a sudden they just didn't have anything to do anymore. And that is really the birth of modern quant finance. Um, uh, they all, you know, got sucked up into Wall Street uh, and built the financial trading software that has, you know, made us all so stable uh, <laughs> today. Uh, um, and the idea that what, what scientists want to do is just solve difficult problems and that if those difficult problems aren't happening in a lab, mm -hmm. they'll go solve them somewhere. And I don't know where this generation of scientists is going to go, but I'm really interested in that because it could be something really beautiful and positive. It could be you know, into, you know, biohacker spaces, right? You know, right. but it's like, it's like where, it's, you know, it's like the thing that's falling off the truck right now are scientists, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> and like, you yeah. know, where, how are they, where are they gonna so, go? So, I mean, and I think that's yeah. the role of art, yeah. right? Because I think what art does is it creates a social context and a framework within which to think about these things. And I think that artists are gonna be the ones that are gonna ask the hard synthetic biology questions and people are going to express those things. And I, I think that you know, businesses are important once to deploy certain things, but, the, but they shouldn't be the, 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 um, you know, the, the bastions of, of ethics, right? Or, or, or of, of questioning society. And so, so I think that the, the, the convergence of art and, and, and the scientists falling off the truck is extremely important right now to help us understand these things, because when you, when you, like that paper that you showed, like most people can't read scientific papers, and actually, you know, I hate it. There, I hate there was a, there was a, yeah. one of our scientists, um, uh, Ed, who you know, yeah. um, he said that, you know, um, I think we've discovered free will, and I was like, what do you mean? He says, well, here's a paper, and I looked at the paper, and I couldn't understand why it had anything to do with free will, but it showed that there was a, when you tap your finger, like tell somebody to just tap it randomly, there's a certain part of your brain that fires every time your finger decides to tap. So somehow that part of your brain is the part that decides when you're tapping your finger. But it's written in a complicated way yeah. to the point where it's, I feel like it's almost on purpose, mm -hmm. obscured so that the philosophers can't understand it. <laughs> because the, what, the last thing you want is a philosopher coming after you and saying, how dare you discover <laughs> that free will is, or think that free will is a chemical, you know? Right, right. Well, also the, the, you know, the entire, the, uh, you know, uh, I hadn't really had any contact with professional lab coat wearing scientists until I got to MIT and you know and have really have learned much more sort of you know really how how the how the business of science really works and one of the things that's interesting to me is is that um, you know you start down the road to publish a paper somewhere and all of your incentives are in line to somehow succeed in this and publish that paper and what that produces is, you know, as it turns out, is a lot of, a lot of bad science, right? Because, because the incentive, you, you know, you can't, you're not going to publish that you failed, but yet, by the nature of exploration, most of these things should fail, right? And so, and so what happens is, is that, you know, people are publishing, let's say, you know, negotiable results, uh, uh, and there's not a good system to kind of retract something from publication. There's not a, there's not a good system you know, for somebody to, to raise their hand. This is what happened with Trivers in, in New Jersey. You know, that, 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 you know, when you find something wrong with a paper, you can't, you can't delete, right? It's, it's, you know, it's written into the record. And so I think, I think one thing that has to happen with science is it, it, needs, to, it, it needs to have the, um, the flexibility that, that, that contemporary tools have what I see is, is that it's really stuck in, in very formal, uh, uh, rigorous structures. So. But, I, but what, you're breaking those barriers down though, right? I mean. Yeah, we're yeah. trying to. Um, and really what we're doing is we're taking a lot of lessons from computer science. So of course my background is in computing. And in computing, it's so easy to share your research, and it's so easy to define your ideas because you're, you're codifying it in, in an unambiguous language, in a, mm -hmm. a computer program. Um, and, and, you know, when people publish papers, they, they want to publish, they want other people to cite their paper. Um, and, and there's, you know, ways to do that. Obviously, clarity and great graphics and stuff like that helps along with a good idea. But what's really cool about software, particularly open source software, is that 
you know, your, your metric of how useful you are as a researcher is that are there other people using your tools and are they building other tools on top of your tools? Um, and, and that can happen in all the sciences because people build on top of other scientists, but it requires you to share your actual work, not just the paper. Yeah, and what's, what I find interesting, because you're talking about open source, we had this with software, we're starting with science, but Bunny, when you were taking me around Shenzhen, there's something, it feels open because there's complete disregard for intellectual property and you can get the schematics of every single phone, right. but you don't tell everybody everything, right? So there's like this kind of op sort of open, but not really open. And, and right. I mean, can you describe how information is shared and how people, how, how this works there? Just mean the, the general, the IP ecosystem? Yeah, the IP, but, but and, yeah. and also how knowledge is built on top of, Yeah, you know. it's, it, it's, it's interesting. They have kind of a, a slightly different view. Um, in, the, in sort of the Western IP ecosystem, there's the idea that you have patents and copyrights, which I call a broadcast model for IP, that you can have one person telling the world, and I own this idea and it's mine. In the Chinese ecosystem, it's more of a network model, right? You share your ideas with anyone around you, and you're not gonna collect royalties from the whole world, but the person that you shared the idea with oftentimes has something in exchange for it. So I will have no trouble to share you with you the schematics of my phone if you can take a look at it and then you'll sell me a cheaper part, right? And so that's actually one oftentimes barrier for discovery of, of um, you know, more, more cheaper ecosystems is that you're too nervous. You keep everything closed in your company and your vendors can't support you because you don't trust them. In China, you just bring your vendors in and show them the problem because you know that even though there's a chance they can also help your competitor, they'll also make your product cheaper, right? Mm -hmm. And so this sort of very transactional, sort of closer view uh, idea, uh, doesn't fit at all into the Western laws. And we just call it like outright copying or like, like mayhem. But in fact, it, it's a, there's a rule to it, it's just different. Because you share with people you trust. Yeah, you share with people you trust or who have an incentive, re, uh, 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 an incentive to help you. Right? Yeah. A lot of times it's just reading, what is this person's incentive? Are they truly my competitor? Or are they, are they you know, of course they, there's a chance they can compete, but mm -hmm. is my benefit potentially better? Um, whereas this sort of broadcast IP ecosystem, you can put the idea out there and you can sue any random person in the room uh, for royalties or rights later on. You don't care because there's a legal system to enforce that and there's this, there's a, you know, and that's a very different method. And, and it would be interesting to think about how that affects, that just what you said affects the architecture of the city, for instance, you know, and, and because, for instance, in Japan, we used to have these, or we still have, but less so, these keretsu, right? These mm. groups of companies and subcontractors that shared everything, right. but then across those groups you didn't share. And so that created a certain structure of business. Now that's, that's evolved, um, but you're talking about somewhere in between, right? Because right. it's not like you have these, like, or in Korea where you have these big families, right. you have these networks of people who right. are trusting each other for a variety of reasons, right? right. right. Blood or right. relationships. Right? Yeah. I don't know, but, in, in, but that's similar in science. I mean, I think there's, Bruno Latour wrote a great book called um, Science in Action, which actually debunks the idea that science is pure and clean and that it's all about politics and who likes who and who cites who, and that actually it's a, it's a lot more like these Chinese networks yeah, than, yeah, yeah. than we'd like to think. Well, right? I think, I think the, the, the idea of a heavily enforced broadcast model is a bit artificial. Ultimately, humans do work by networks. Mm -hmm. uh, I think humans are, are fundamentally local individuals yeah. um, and we abstract the world as, as outsiders beyond this barrier. And so science for sure is, uh, you know, if you know the editor or the, or the, or the person who's reviewing the papers or, or, you know, the peer reviews are not completely uh, unbiased, you can, you can get, there's some really dumb papers that get into nature and I don't even see why they get in these top tier journals. Mm -hmm. um, but if you just st stand them there and say it, a lot of people have an incentive to beat you down and say, well, you're not a real scientist, you understand how this works, or whatever it is. It's, it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a difficult system to overturn and to reform. Um, yeah. But it, I mean, it ties a little bit to the conclusion of my talk that I got the idea from Kevin, which is architecture has typically not put humans at the center. Right. And I think a lot of the way that cities move is based on how humans interact and humans communicate and the things that we don't see. And I, I wonder if there's a, if, if 
if it's more or less, or how, how, you, how do you reinvent or rethink sort of cities in the context of thinking about human beings as um, human-centric design? I mean, how would you do that? I think there's, I think there's one. Um, so, so we've built, um, we've built all these technologies that have, um, that have allowed us to do, to, to, to get whatever we want, whenever we want it on our own terms. Um, so the idea that uh, we would all go home to see the same thing at eight o'clock on the same network is, you know, relatively absurd uh, at this point. Um, and all of the, all the institutions that synchronized us, except for maybe sports, um, have kind of fallen away. And that um, I think that we, and, and that's fine, it's, you know, it, it, it is what it is, but I think, that, I think that they served a very fundamental human need of feeling synchronized with other people, uh, feeling like you're on the same page as a crowd, um, which people used to be able to feel when they watched television. They, were, they would watch it alone at home, uh, but they also knew that tens of millions of other people were also watching the same thing at the same time. That, as that's fallen away, I think that we're hungrier and hungrier for anything that satisfies that that, that, that allows us to feel like we're part of something that is happening with a lot of people and it's happening now and, uh, and, and that, that my world is not just me. How cities function in order to, uh, in order to, to, to satisfy that hunger, I think, is, is like, there are, there are ways to address that that we haven't seen yet. I don't know what they are. Yeah, I mean, right now it's protests and Olympics. Protests yeah. are good, yeah, 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 <laughs> riots, yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but yeah, no, I, I definitely agree that there's this, the, the chaos has created this vacuum for synchronization, mm -hmm. which um, I do think that sports are, 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 are hugely important. And, and um, I mean, I think as we think about the role that the Olympics play on Tokyo, yeah. I think that's going to be, I mean, it it's already has started to synchronize everybody sort of right. investing and thinking about the future. And, 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 I, and I think that that's, that we, we, do, we do have a yearning. So amid all of this chaos, yeah. um, I think that's an important, yeah. it's an important function. I, I think maybe just another thing that, uh, from the you know, city architecture standpoint, um, one one tendency that humans do tend to have is they tend to clump and, and self segregate. I think there's some research done about like, anyways, they they, they did a mathematical model and showed that that actually the segregation of neighborhoods into poor and rich and so forth actually is an emergent feature mm -hmm. of how people interact, and that that can create economic barriers in the city. So if you create like a low income region around certain areas, that part of the city will start to fall off and, and not really integrate with the whole city. So one of the one of the big challenges I think in urban planning is is how do you enforce sort of inequality and, and make sure that, that you don't basically just get these districts that grow, gentrify and get super expensive and that somehow um, there's, and, and as, as to your point about businesses, will will always want to optimize their profit in a particular region, which squeezes out all of the interesting things that kind of made it there. But the businesses don't care that they've rang out that every last cent from that region, and and, and is now the former husk of itself. The business was profitable, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so one of the one of the things that I actually really do like about Singapore, actually living there, is that they've been very good at at um, sort of preserving um, sort of inequality. The, some of the best property in, in the country is owned by the government, and it's a very low corruption mm -hmm. environment. And so they can actually enforce price fixed low rent you know, on top of rail stations for the people who actually work there to live there and artists and people to keep these neighborhoods sort of cool and interesting. Um, and if you were kind of in the US, they would try to do that, but then businesses would game the system where landlords would then buy the low rent things and then sublet to people and the price would go up, eventually hit like true market like equal market. And so that this, these, are play, these are areas where like free market can't fix these problems. The free market actually tends against it. And that's one of the places where as a city planner you have to, have to look for these social incentives and be like, how do we structure society so that we can have a, a greater sense of equality, a greater sense of sharing, uh, without like trying to necessarily do it by rules, but you right. try to do it by incentives so all the players have an incentive to play. You have to 
create a game. You have to create a game. For example. Yeah. 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 And we'll call it capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be awesome. So, so we have a few minutes left. Maybe we can open it up for any comments or questions from the audience. I know it's been it's a slightly tricky topic, but any questions or comments, please? Yes, Ms. Gutsan, would you like to speak? Thank you. Impressive. Thank you for Bonnie uh, sharing the Shinsan situation. And uh, Kevin, very impressive presentation. So, and I have a question to uh, Connie, uh, Connor, sorry. Connor. Um, now, I think that everybody thinking the same thing, uh, same feeling. Uh, what is the future of synthetic bio? And uh, I think that many people feel fear. Um, so I want to ask you, um, so you have, uh, you, you know, you, you have a relationship with the young generation and uh, I saw the presentation from, uh, by Joey. Um, young people, you know, uh, it's like a young label, you know, everybody trying to make the new synthetic design of biotech, you know. And uh, we just, just started. And uh, now we can design the bio. And then it, it's getting changing, you know, what we want, what we want to design. So what do you feel the young generation, what kind of wants they have now? And uh, young generation doesn't have a kind of a prejudice for the future yet, but uh, what kind of wants they have? And then, you know, elder people, <laughs> adult people, what kind of wants, negative thing and positive thing, what kind of you know, want for the future, you feel now? Well, I, I think um, there, some of the more interesting projects in synthetic biology that are being done by young people um, have uh, uh, sort of a, often an element of social justice or fixing a problem that they see that is uh, systemic that has no other solution. And so one pr uh, project that comes to mind right now, it's called Moofree, and they are creating cow-free milk, milk, real milk, without cows. And the idea behind this is, you know, in, in, in Canada and the United States, if you're getting milk from cows, these cows may not be treated very well. They live their lives in, uh, I guess, something like a, a prison of sorts. Um, and if there is a way to liberate uh, uh, the production of milk from the cow, same thing with meat. There are other groups that are working to create uh, uh, meat or, or murder-free meat, they call it. Um, there, there's a significant effort working towards that. And I think um, that kind of stuff wouldn't necessarily be produced by the incumbent large corporations that are working in biotechnology where they're looking for big blockbuster medicine products and fuel products. Um, these other products like Mufri and, and, and whatnot are, are relatively long shots. They're gonna be difficult to create. And even if they do create uh, uh, these products successfully, um, it's, it's an untested market. There's, there's definitely a market for drugs. Right. I know that for a fact. Right. But for milk made from microbes in, whether it comes from a, a, a brewery or, or your own desktop uh, bioreactor, I don't know, nobody knows. Um, but the interesting thing is that these young kids are empowered with the tools uh, and the knowledge um, and as I mentioned before, there are uh, VC firms now that are also excited about these ideas and are giving them the, the capital that they need to, to, to make it happen, or at least to test it. Um, and so I, I think those kind of ideas are, are ones that are really popular with young people. They're the kind of ideas that are getting a lot of press. Um, and more young people are reading about these and trying to think of, well, what other things can we do uh, that are going to help the world? And, and another example is a bioremediation. So we talk about waste. Uh, uh, I think, um, or Bunny, you showed a photo of a young guy disassembling uh, cell phones and taking the chips and reselling the chips. But there's still quite a bit of value left on those PCBs in, right. in trace amounts. Right. And, and there are groups that are out there that are looking towards uh, um, using biological processes to sustainably and, and relatively ecologically uh, 
remove those trace elements and then uh, um, bring them back to market. So I, th I, I, I think those are the kind of things that we're starting to see. And, and I think it's a, getting back to using the word design, um, it should feel terrible and ugly to create something that hurts the system. Do you know what I mean? It should just be so obviously wrong as a design pattern. Because what we find, for instance, if you write really ugly software, you don't want to show anybody. Um, people will think you're, you have bad design or you're, you're stupid. And I think I, the younger generation, I find, overall, to be much more ecologically sensitive than the older generation. I mean, they don't like to throw things away, and, and to your point. And so, to me, I'm actually much more confident that the younger generation will start to adopt a design practice that says, I want to make something beautiful, and the way it's going to be beautiful, that it has a net positive impact on the environment after it's finished, rather than what we currently do with most of our technology, which is it has a net negative impact. And, and so, so I'm, I'm hoping that, and again, to get back to art and design, is that, that, that we have to instill that, not, as a, not just as an ethic, but actually as a, it, it has, it's going to be not cool well, you know, oh, that's so uncool to do that, is, is I think where we need to kind of angle. Maybe I think part of the reason why, why that aesthetic exists is actually, I mean, the younger generation has, they're, they're a lot more uh, connected in the local environments that they live in, right? They, they, it's not cool to throw away stuff because they may live closer, for example, to the dump areas because they're not as rich to be able to live outside, right? And, um, I think one of the key things, you know, in, in maybe one of the problems for city planning is a lot of people who plan cities don't live in the city they plan at the end of the day. They may have some other objective mm -hmm. uh, and some other outside incentive that may them, make them do it one way. So I think it'd be an interesting challenge that every city planner basically has to put their residence somewhere in the city. It can't be the best spot that is the king spot, but they have to. Mm -hmm. Basically, at the end of the day, a random number generator runs and they get assigned a flat, mm -hmm. and they now have to live there for 10 years because they planned the city. And if you knew that the risk for you was that you had to live in possibly one of the worst parts of the city that you planned, you'd be much more conscientious about the overall. And, and, and I think that's the idea of co-design, of allowing and enabling people to design their own solutions. So, you know, like the internet, a lot of people are afraid of hackers, but hackers, most of the hackers that I know that can destroy the internet don't because they live there and they love it more than anybody else. You right. know? Mm -hmm. And, and I, I, I had this uh, philanthropist friend in, in, in Brazil, and she found that there was 10,000 people of a 30,000 person slum went over her land. So what she did was she moved in yeah. and helped fix the slums right. and then handed it off to them. But she lived there for years, you know, and, and because she thought that was going to be the best way for her to turn that community into something that's useful. But I think, I think that that's a, as a design principle, is you, you, you have to eat your own. Yeah, dog yeah. fooding. Yeah. 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 I, I, I use I my know. own laptop. I don't know <laughs> if, you, if you talked about this already earlier today, but the transition at the Media Lab uh, that, you, that you brought up from demo, demo or die to deploy or die, um, I don't know exactly what you mean by it, but I know, <laughs> I know, I know how I interpret it uh, in our group, um, which, is, which is the difference between thinking about you know, this is the thing, to what, what, what does this thing do when it enters the system of the world and the people who use it? Like, yes, it's really cool that you can do a bunch of computing now on your wrist, um, but what will happen when everyone is spending time, you know, with their, you know, basically with their shoulder hyperextended for long periods of time? Uh, in the same ways that we all broke our backs using Blackberries, um, you know, like, like and, and, to, and to think about the derivative systems rather than the thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that's, a, that, you know, that's been sort of formalized in a way at the Media Lab, but I think that's also an ethos that's pervasive. Mm -hmm. so. Then we have time for one more question, so please, at the back. Hey, uh, it's a very short and concrete question for Bonnie, uh, but our team, me and Ektan and Dito and Tolga, we are going to uh, design, a, well, we're going to try to design a derivative version of the MicroPython board, 
And uh, basically, I'm just asking which software you recommend. <laughs> Eagle, Altium, uh, AllCAD, or KiCad, or whatever. He's designing a derivative of what? So I couldn't quite hear the... What the board? Uh, PyBoard. It's a microcontroller for running MicroPython. Okay. And, and you want to know what design software to use? Yeah, because you obviously know about hardware design. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I personally use a package called Altium DXP, but it's expensive. Yes. But it's very good for what it does. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, it's, sorry. <laughs> it's not a very day. philosophical question. Yeah, we, can, we, can, we, can, we can have a conversation a little more. Okay. About okay. I think I should meet. Firstly, but. Okay. It was sort of a vague discussion. It wasn't very concrete, but, uh, but uh, thank you for bearing with us. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ito. Could we have another round of applause uh, for the panelists uh, and the moderator? Andrew, Connor, Kevin, thank you very much uh, to you.